<laughs> it's been a while. I am in my summer Boston apartment, but I'm moving in this Saturday to my on-campus dorm. So this will probably be the last time you see me in this location. But I did want to film a really quick book review video. I've been planning on filming today, but it's only started raining. So I don't know if it's a vibe or if it's annoying. Let's just say it's for the ambiance. I have some coffee. We're just gonna be chatting about books. So yeah, let's dive right in. So this book review video is all about books that I have read in 2021 so far. Just as a disclaimer, a lot of these books are books that I read as part of syllabi for classes I took during the school year. I have gathered as many of the physical copies of books as I could, but some of them I did read ebook versions of. So I hope that was okay. The rain sounds are getting really loud. Is that okay? Okay, we're just gonna roll with it. Another quick warning is please make sure to look up all of the potential trigger warnings for all the books. Some of them do deal with very sensitive content and topics. So I just want you to make sure that you are looking this up and reading at your own discretion, making sure that you're comfortable with the material before you proceed with them. Alright, so first up we have Minor Feelings by Kathy Park Hong. I read this for my English class. It was an interesting read for sure, and I know that it got a lot of attention with the Stop Asian Hate movement this past year. I feel like maybe some of you have already read it, but if you haven't, it's essentially an autobiography and it's written as a collection of essays. She writes in a very strong tone, that's something that you notice right away. And from what I found, her essays contained contents in equal parts of relatability and some questionable declarations, that was just my own opinion. Hong touches on many, many aspects of her Asian American experience. She's also the daughter of Korean immigrants like me, so I was able to relate just a little bit more to some of the things that she was saying, but overall she definitely had a very distinct, unique lifestyle, upbringing. I think there's something to be said about the unique narrative that she has to tell. Guaranteed, even if you don't necessarily agree with any of the things that she's saying or some of the things that she's saying, you will definitely find relatable contents that you can touch back to your own life or something that you even learn from um, the insights that she has to offer. It is very unapologetically raw and honest. That's part of her writing appeal, I feel like, and something that a lot of people seem to hold a general consensus for when discussing this book. And that can sometimes be a little bit discomforting, but again, it's very, very beautifully written. And they all kind of touch on different topics, but they individually cover a wide range of, of her own experiences. So I definitely would love to reread this at some point. I think my sister is going to borrow it soon. Something to check out if you're interested. Then we have A Good Girl's Guide to Murder. I'll pull up the cover here. This is one of those books I read as an ebook. So Good Girl's Guide to Murder by Holly Jackson is a kind of thriller, crime, mystery book. Not really thriller, but definitely mystery and crime. And it's set in the present day, so it's kind of like a realistic fiction in a way. Essentially, the book revolves around a small town murder mystery. A popular high school senior, Andy Bell, was murdered by her boyfriend, Sal Singh, who then killed himself, which really shook up this little small town and left them very shocked. But then five years later, this high school senior, Pip, she is looking at this case that happened five years back and can't shake the feeling that there's something more to the story, that maybe there's something that investigators, police just couldn't find that was more in line with the truth. So for her final senior project, she decides to dig more into the case, enlisting the help of Sal's younger brother. There are so many twists and turns that Honestly, if you did see it coming, maybe you were surprised to see how it unfolded. I thought it wasn't necessarily incredibly impressive or beautiful writing. I don't think that was the appeal of this book. I think the appeal was definitely how it was written. And with that, I mean the plot and the flow of the writing was just really, really tight and well-structured. Honestly, really great mystery novel if you're looking to get back into reading and that's the kind of genre that you're interested in. It's honestly such a fun one to talk about with others if you're reading it in real time. I actually read this for my discussion book club. We all had so much fun just talking about the book while we were reading it for that month. Just reading for the main characters, particularly Pip, so I think it's honestly a really fun read. So up next we have We Should Never Meet by Amy Fan. Again, I read an ebook version of this and this was also for my English class. The genre of this is historical fiction, realistic fiction, but it's so 
so beautifully written i would have to say one of my favorite books that i've read this year so far so i believe this is fawn's debut novel it's written as a collection of eight loosely connected short stories and it follows the lives of four vietnamese american orphans they've all been displaced as a result of the war in vietnam in the 1970s the majority of them had been a part of operation baby lift if you don't know operation baby lift was an initiative from the u.s government to airlift orphans babies out of vietnam into america and other western ally countries and these short stories just follow their lives not even necessarily about the orphans themselves from start to finish but about the different characters the different people along the way who had helped them end up in america where they all eventually grew up it's just so 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 beautifully written so well structured so poetic and haunting and gripping and you really just can't stop reading it the beauty of the way that fans structured these short stories is they are not all necessarily tied to people that you would obviously expect to be connected to these people it's about people who are even related tangentially to the stories of these orphans people who had only come into contact with them once or maybe never even knew them or met them but they were all connected in some small way and fans still fleshed out each of their individual narratives so beautifully even if they only had like a few pages of time dedicated to their stories it was just such a really beautiful way of looking at how all of our lives are so connected to so many different people that you wouldn't even expect and how they all I'll shape who we are even if unknowingly. It's one of those books I feel like I'm going to think about for a really long time because it's the first time I feel like I'd read a book like that in a while. Coffee break. All right, up next we have Severance by Ling Ma. This is kind of like fantasy fiction, dystopian satire for sure. I read this also for my English class. As you can see, there is a little bit of a connecting thread. My English class was on Asian American literature, so that's why I have a lot of books under that umbrella category. So this is a satirical science fiction novel and it follows the life of Candace Chen. She is this Chinese American product coordinator for a Bible publishing company and that is a huge part of her identity which is very interesting because some of the satire is kind of looking at capitalism in the US, in the world at large, how it connects us to each other. And there's this fever called Shen fever you know, this is very crazy. Some slight connections to what's going on today. <laughs> Shen fever originated in China and it eventually took over the entire world, became this global pandemic. So a lot of how this book progresses is looking at the way that Shen fever infiltrates people's daily lives, but then also our own reactions to the fever. And I say our as in like, people in the book and an interesting part of this is that the book jumps around a lot in the timeline of, of Candace's life it's kind of set in this mid apocalyptic scene so not post apocalyptic mid apocalyptic which is what makes it so fascinating and because it's so realistic to I feel like how people would actually react to a deadly fever taking over the world to this degree you see how capitalism and our, the way that our brains have been wired because of capitalism causes us to react so interestingly to what would be such a huge disruption in our daily lives. There's this really interesting review included in the book from the New Yorker, Jiang Fan. I don't know if I said that right, Jiang Fan. Understated and restrained somewhat in the manner of Kazuo Ishiguro, Ma is at her most deft when depicting this kind of severance, the amputation of the immigrant's past preserved like a phantom limb whose pain is haunted with absence. A huge part of Candace's narrative in Severance is definitely her Asian American immigrant background, being the daughter of immigrant parents, being an immigrant herself, and how that pressure slash baggage is kind of pervasive in her life even into adulthood. Just wanted to add that in really quickly. It's not all satire, it's also really interesting commentary on that part of the Asian American immigrant experience. Something to consider. All right, so next up we have Kafka on the Shore by Haruki Murakami. I don't have the physical copy with me right now. It's at home, but I did read the physical copy. So here's the cover for now. <laughs> Kafka is kind of like this metaphysical, magical realism fantasy fiction book. A huge part of this book, because of the genre, you will have to engage in some suspension of reality because that's really the only way you'll be able to get through this book. It really focuses on the alternating narratives of Kafka, Tamura, a 15 year old boy who's run away from home, and Nakata. He is an old man, mentally disabled, has a very simple life, but he ends up involved in some sinister 
strange fantastical events and is trying to survive all of these strange events that are happening to him and the same with Kafka and they are incredibly fascinating characters along the way as well. So a huge part of this book is definitely the clear influence from the story of Oedipus. If you don't know, I would suggest you look it up but that is the clearest way I guess I can go about explaining what happens. You are just going to have to read it and take it for what it is and I think that's really the only way you can get through this book. Murakami is known for this kind of magical realism genre and I think that's why he's quite famous for that. His books in general are definitely not for everyone because there are some major trigger warnings in his book. Wouldn't necessarily recommend this wholeheartedly but it was definitely an interesting one not like other books that I've read before. And this is just for my own pleasure. Didn't read this for any class. Next we have The Song of Achilles by Madeline Miller. I will say this right now. You can like take this is on the record for you right here. This is my favorite book that I've read this year. Why, you may ask. <sighs> Let me tell you, The Song of Achilles is based on mythology, Greek mythology, fantasy, fiction, romance, all tied into one. This story sets during the Greek heroic age. It's an adaptation of Homer's Iliad. And if you know the story of Paris of Troy, Helen of Sparta, who was kidnapped, also like the huge wooden horse contraption that's like that story but it's an adaptation of the story of Achilles famous hero in Greek mythology and it's primarily told from the perspective of Patroclus who was Achilles' closest companion it's essentially all the same events just told from his perspective but you know the thing that historians do when you have famous same-sex duos and their narrative that they always run with is they say that they were even the best of friends Miller's adaptation takes that really common analysis flips it on its head and say, hey, what if we recognize the fact that homosexuality was a thing during that time? And says, you know, maybe Patroclus and Achilles were lovers. So there's not really a surprise there. That's kind of like the whole point of the book anyways, but the way that it's written, it's so, so beautifully written. It's so well researched. One of the most well-crafted books I've ever read. I think, honestly, this is a must read. It's so beautiful. I absolutely love, love, love what she did with it. You should definitely read it if you can. Okay, so up next we have The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo by Taylor Jenkins Reid. This tells the story of this fictional, famous, old Hollywood star, glamorous icon, Evelyn Hugo. The thing about Evelyn Hugo is that she's always lived a life in the limelight ever since she rose to fame as a young girl. Since then, she's always had a very tumultuous public relationship with romance and that manifested in the form of seven different husbands over the span of her life. She's famously secretive and just has a lot of mystery surrounding her and her story. But then at the age of 79, she decides finally to give an all-exclusive interview to this small unknown journalist named Monique Grant and in this interview she's agreed to tell her entire life story something that she's never done before something I really recommend that you do with this book is that you go in with zero expectations I think I, I mean I read the blurb and my sister I read it and normally I'd ask my sister like what she thinks about it but I really just jumped right in and I think that's honestly the best way to go about it and as you go along you are in trance with her and you understand why the people in this world are in trance with her as well by the end I was kind of left breathless I think it was so so captivating there isn't necessarily a hero or a protagonist in the story by the end you come to realize that this is really just Evelyn Hugo telling the story of her life. So I think if you're really interested in a mix between realistic fiction and semi like historical fiction, this is a book that I would really highly recommend. It's so beautiful, I will not say anything else, but you should definitely give it a try. Then finally, for books that I have read to completion, we have The Displaced Refugee Writers on Refugee Live. This is edited by Viet Thanh Nguyen. I read this for one of my summer classes. It was an anthropology course about refugee narratives, migrant narratives, and the stories that they tell and carry with them from their homes and their places of origin. This is such such a beautiful collection of essays that I feel like anyone can read, everyone should read, and anyone can get something out of it. All of these writers are refugee writers and so they all have their own stories to tell and they all have their own commentary and insights to offer on 
the refugee figure, the refugee narrative, the role that refugees have in this world, and the way that the world treats them. This is always something that people are talking about when it comes to these kinds of issues, is hearing from the people themselves, not hearing their stories filtered through big nonprofit organizations or global entities. If you can get your hands on this book, I would really recommend it. Even if you can find just a few of the essays individually online, maybe even just look up the authors that are included, I was really, really touched by this collection of essays for sure. So that is all for the books that I've read in their entirety this year. I've also been working through A Tale for the Time Being by Ruth Ezeki for quite a while, literally since the beginning of the summer, but I just haven't had time to finish it. This is how far I got this much. So I'm gonna try to finish this maybe by the end of the month. Or like the end of September, we'll see. This is kind of Murakami-esque magical realism told from the point of view of a young girl in Japan alternating with the point of view of a woman, I think a Japanese American woman. I don't know, she's living on some island. There's a way that their stories are connected. I'm not entirely sure where this is going so I can't really say much else. I am interested to see how this pans out because there are a lot of questions that are currently unanswered for like who's and what's and why's and how so interested in seeing where that goes. All right, so that is completely it for my book review video of, I guess, the midway points of 2021. I hope you enjoy. If you have any book recommendations that are along the same vein of some of these books that I've read or just other amazing titles that you've read this year so far, please leave them in the comments. I love book club-esque discussions. If you want to join my Discord book club, by the way, that is going to be in the description bar below, so be sure to check it out. Come join us. Otherwise, I hope you enjoy this video. I will see you guys very soon. Bye!